All right, all right, all right, all right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, patriots and friends. Excuse me, Professor. Yes. Yeah, so you will be posting this uh, uh, session recording in our uh, modules or not? Can you say that again? Open. You will be posting this uh, recorded session in our modules or not? Like Yes, I will be, yes, that's right, yes. All right. Okay. Okay. okay and we have to and we have to watch a whole session and write only 500 words on this that is right yes yes okay all right so we're going to start so no questions yet okay um so okay. thank you i'm for sorry your i'm okay. sorry yeah okay so again good evening everybody thank you very much for finding the time to join us for uh this promising what promises to be an exciting, fruitful evening. Um, on behalf of the Africa Canada Education Foundation, I welcome all of you. I'm, I'm be juggling uh, speaking and admitting people to the uh, to the event. So forgive me if um, I get distracted here and there. But um, yeah, so we are um, we here today to celebrate. Africa, Africa Day. Um, my name is Dr. Charles Christodade, and I'm your moderator of this event. Uh, before we do anything else, it is proper and fitting to ask the blessing of the Almighty God, God and guide us to the logical end of the event. It is therefore my honor and privilege to call on our sister, Reverend Madeline Nungu to lead us in prayer and to pay homage to the ancestral and current owners of this land, the land on which we are hosting this event. Um, Reverend, the cyber floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um... Professor, thank you for this opportunity. Let's give honor to whom honor is due and to the almighty God. So let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity celebrating the day of the Canadian African women. We want to appreciate you so much for the opportunity we have to stay, to carry this event in the first day I appreciate it. I want to thank you so much. We have no strength of us, no power of us, but through you, we can do all things. We pray that you take preeminence in this deliberation, that all that we will do will give you back the glory. Take every honor, take every glory, take every adoration in every presentation that all the speakers will be giving. Be thou exalted. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are praying. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, uh, may I crave your indulgence in sharing a brief outline of the um, activities, the history and the activities and the mandate of the Africa Canada Education Foundation, ASEF, uh, the host of this event. ASEF is a British Columbia based, a registered non profit organization mandated to support educational projects, including the provision of scholarships, educational materials, and other resources um, to underserved but promising students in rural Africa and underserved and marginalized new African Canadian immigrant and refugee students. Let me. People, I'm sorry, juggling two things, wearing two hats. Um, ASEF was formed in 2011, um, working in collaboration with a Delta based AfriTech, the Ghanaian Canadian Association of BC, Kwanlin Polytechnic, University uh, Social Justice Students. 
It has since provided scholarships to several students in Ghana and in DC, as well as donated over $15,000 um, worth of um, educational materials and equipment, refurbished computers, backpacks, uh, maths, sets, pens, pencils, and many more. Our current project is uh, we have adopted um, the Rayan Rayhan Vocational um, School uh, of Orphan Girls at Nisano in Cape Coast Central Ghana. Together with the Ghanaian Canadian Association of DC, we have donated a multi purpose stove and $1,000 under our Akloa or Village Scholarship Project uh, to support the school. I encourage all of you to donate to our project by visiting our website, www.africacanadaeducationfoundation.org. Today's event is uh, the first in a series of activities in our African Canadian Heritage Project. Uh, the African Canadian Heritage Project is a multi layered, youth-led undertaken, dedicated to reviving, celebrating, and honoring African Canadian and global African history through films, dialogue, culture, and education, while acknowledging the value of all cultures and their contribution to the human atmosphere, uh, the African Canadian Heritage Project will engage Canadian um, multicultural audiences in the revival of Africa's rich and often marginalized and distorted cultural heritage. It will remind us of Africa's forgotten stories, celebrate her abandoned heroes and heroines, rediscover of her lost wisdom, and reestablish our human capacity for respect, dignity, and inclusiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, compatriots and friends, today is Africa Day. 63 years ago, on May the 25th, 1963, the Organization of African Unity, now Africa Union, was born when 32 African leaders met in the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, to establish the body. The theme for this year's anniversary is arts, culture, and heritage, levers for building the Africa we want. The theme we selected, we have chosen for tonight's event is African-Canadian women in history. We decided that it is only proper and fitting on this monumental day uh, that we should be celebrating the unparalleled contributions of African-Canadian women to the development of our country and by extension, um, the global African um, world. The importance of our mothers, sisters, wives, and there I say side chicks, <laughs> forgive me for being um, undiplomatic, to our collective of being cannot be overemphasized. It is therefore, it is um, for this reason uh, that Dr. Pedro Pedri Adri the celebrated Ghanaian educationist and scholar noted that, and I'm quoting him, when you educate a man, you educate one person, but when you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, observed that, to paraphrase him, the level of a country's development is measured by the revolutionary awareness of her women. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest speakers are going to bring different perspectives on this theme. 
Now let's pause for some housekeeping items. Um, they will be having an African heritage quiz. Um, uh, the quiz will be based on um, a video that will be screening um, very soon. And I encourage you to pay particular attention, watch the video, the documentary, uh, wrapped, with rapt attention. And uh, if you will take notes, because you'll be asked questions. Um, and, and if you win, you'll be given a prize. There will be three prizes uh, for the um, winner the, and the two runners ups. Our speakers and performers are called upon to briefly introduce themselves prior to uh, their speech or performance. Um, and please keep your microphones muted okay, until you want to ask a question. Um, you may want to unmute your cameras so we can see your lovely faces, but always make sure that your um, cameras, I mean, your microphones are muted. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, it's my singular honor and pleasure to invite our invited guests or the yeah, invited guests. Um, I hope Honorable Bruce Ralston has joined us. Honorable Bruce Ralston is um, Minister of Energy, Mines and Petroleum Resources and MLA for Surrey Wale. I hope he is here. Let me see. Looks like he isn't here yet. So let me move on then. Okay. Okay, that okay, that is somebody's job. Um so then if this uh, before, hopefully he will join us soon. Uh, in the meantime, may I now invite Honorable Andrew Mies, um, Messier, I beg your pardon, Messier Emily for Langley. Thank you so much, Charles. And I'll start by apologizing because I have a very strong three-year-old woman upstairs that uh, might, uh, you know, interrupt uh, the greetings I'm bringing. Um, but I just want to bring greetings from the government of British Columbia. I'm Andrew Mercier. I'm the MLA for Langley and Parliamentary Secretary for Skills Training. Uh, in the NDP government. And I'm talking right now from the traditional territory of the Kwantlen, Katsi, Matsky, and Semiamu speaking peoples and Langley. And, you know, I just want to say it is an honor uh, to be an MLA uh, in a municipality that hosts an organization like the Africa Canada Education Foundation. And to have someone like Dr. Charles Quistedade uh, is a constituent. The work that you're doing right now is so critically important now more than ever you get a real stark reminder of the importance of you know respectful conversation peaceful cohabitation and social justice um, just in the news today that it's the one year anniversary of the death of george floyd uh, in the united states uh, in a barbaric uh, you know, uh, a barbaric of systemic racism and, you know, this week is anti-racism week. We've proclaimed an anti-racism week for the province. Uh, you know, we as a society shouldn't have to be at that point, but unfortunately we are. And there's been a demonstrable increase um, in overt acts of racism and hate crimes across North America in the past few years. And the work that you're doing and the conversations you are having is so critical. And there's so much work that has to be done on that. But this uh, is such an important part of it. And, you know, just listening um, to Dr. Quistadade, uh, you know, in your introduction there, Charles, talking about the, the strides that African women have made in Canadian history and the role that they've played, and, you know, sometimes the lack of attribution that's gone on to them. I just want to tell a quick, you know, story about, um, about when I was in law school, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, but when I was in law school in Halifax, uh, coincided with a period of time where a young, a young woman named Elle Jones was appointed poet laureate 
of, uh, of Halle. And Elle Jones is a, is a woman of African descent who was raised in Manitoba, um, who's made it a mark of her poetry uh, to be outspoken about the African experience within Canada. And I learned so much listening to Elle Jones and I had no idea. Um, and I come, you know, a white male of European descent from a place of immense privilege. And I had no idea about the story of Africa in Nova Scotia and about how in the 1960s, uh, you know, white liberal reformers bulldozed, bulldozed the whole town uh, and moved it. Uh, they picked everyone up and moved them to North Preston, North Department and left them there with no services. They never checked the boundaries of people's property to compensate them property as a kind of bare minimum. Um, and what happened over the preceding decades is it was the it was the women of African descent in that community that were the rich people fighting for services, fighting for recognition, and fighting for restitution. And you know, they all are unheralded. I think, you know, there's no, um, there's no big film or film or anything like that. And I just thought the role of Ellen Jones poetry and the oral tradition, keeping that alive. That is, that's important. So it's an honor to be asked to come and speak to you. I know you're going to have some great conversations. And I want to thank all of you for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. Thank you very much. And let's move on. Now I have another honor, a similar one, to invite uh, the Acton High Commissioner of Ghana to Canada, um, Mr. Mauto Alifo. Mr. Mauto Alifo has always been with us. This is his um, really the third time he is joining us um, in BC, um, albeit, you know, virtually. We hope that sooner or later, when things get better, he would come down here so we can meet him in person. So, Mr. Alifo, the floor, the cyber floor, as they say, is yours. Thank you, moderator, Dr. Quist Adade. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here today with you. So, let me first start by acknowledging the uh, ministers of your province, the uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen uh, who are here with us on this very important day. Happy Africa Day to all of you. When I was invited to this event, the first thing that struck me why I must be here is the fact that there is a convergence of ideas between what you are doing and what diplomatic missions, especially the African diplomatic missions uh, should be doing in Canada. Uh, why do I say so? Creation of awareness, fostering understanding among people. Yes, there was a bitter past, but there is hope ahead and we need to create platforms for dialogue to be able to uh, understand one another better in a very troubled world. So the significance is not lost on me. And then I also look back and I thought about what happened a year ago uh, concerning the gruesome murder of George Floyd. So I thought about it and I started reflecting on your theme, the uh, African women in history. And a number of thoughts came to me and I think because I'm not an academic, I'm just in the diplomatic world, I would need to ask these questions so your panelists could help me to better understand the issues. Uh, African women over the centuries, whether they, are, they were on the African continent or those taken to the New World, to Asia, to the Gulf uh, region, all of them had been subjected to tribulations that cannot be described here tonight. So what do you think that went through their mind? Where the mother 
of uh, Olaudo, Olauda Equinum, Equinum, otherwise known as uh, Gustavus Vasa. What is it that goes through the mind of African women all these years up to the George Floyd event? where every time sons, brothers, husbands are just cut to nothingness over the centuries. But our mothers, our African mothers, braved it all, all these years. And thought about the prominent uh, African women over the ages, I thought about Queen Nani of uh, Jamaica. I thought about Ya yeah, Santiwa in Ghana, Rosa Parks, Sejina Truth, Amina, Queen Amina of uh, Northern Nigeria, the women soldiers of Dahomey. And then right here in Canada, uh, I Googled it and I was very impressed with the role of Canadian women of African descent, such as Mary Ann Shad, Carrie, Kathleen Livingston, Carrie Best, Violet King. Then I looked on the contemporary world stage. I noticed uh, African women are getting to the front bench now with the mention of Selif Johnson of Liberia, Joyce Banda of Malawi, Samia Hassan, who is now the current president of Tanzania, the deputy secretary general of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed. So from historical times to contemporary times, African women have braved it all. They are like the center of gravity, putting families together, keeping societies together. So on this date, my question, to us, to your panelists, is what must we be doing as men, as brothers, as husbands, to support these hardworking women who have endured tribulations in silence all these years? In Ghana, where we come from, together with Dr. Krista Daddy, the old lady is supposed to be the wisest woman in every community. Women are the symbol, they are like the repository of wisdom. That is why before the king will pass judgment, he must consult the eldest woman in the community for advice. And he will never, a wise man will never disregard counsel from the repository of wisdom. So the women, are the first teachers in our lives. And I'm thinking today, what messages should we be giving also to our women, people of African descent in our communities, so that right from delivery, when we come out into this new world, we would be imbued with values for hard work, staying away from trouble, staying away from drugs, keeping to studies, education, education, education. And that is what the likes of Dr. Dade are doing. What must we be doing to make this a reality? I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, we now move on to the next speaker. Uh, first speaker, um, that is um, Trish Mandel, the council, council member. Um, of um, the city of Kukulam. Um Honorable Trish Mandel. It looks like you're muted. Looks like you're muted. You are Chris? muted, please. On um, 
Dr. Kors? You are still muted, madam. Um, Honorable Mandel, you are still muted. Can you hear me? You are still muted. Is on mute your microphone. Uh, Dr. Chris. Yes. Are you able to share her slides? Oh, oh she wants to share her slides. Okay, yes. I yes, can do please. It. Okay. Thank you. I emailed that to you already. Thank you. Oh, you mean you email her slides to me? Yes, I did. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't get that one. Oh, my God. We are in trouble. <laughs> That's okay. You can check. you find it there. Just check your email. Okay. All right. Okay. So there's going to be a short, a short disruption here. Let me see if I can do that very um Okay. Okay, please bear with me. I'll be right with you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear oh, you. Yeah. I am so sorry. So, I, I could hear you, but everything was frozen. I couldn't even unmute myself. Right. Okay. okay. Technology as we know it right now. Yes, our lives are our lives are controlled by pieces of technology. <laughs> Indeed. If right. you can allow That's... me to just uh, recover my notes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, do you still need other your PowerPoint, or are you going to use your notes? Um, I'll just use my notes okay. at this oh. point. It's like oh, okay. too much right. hassle to get everything running. Okay, very just good. Just one second. Just gonna open up here. My apologies. I was all set up and ready to go. <laughs> and lo and behold, you know, that happens. It does. It's happened. Almost there. Okay. Yep, it's still very slow. It looks like there's a problem with my Wi Fi, but I think we'll get there. Thank you so much. Now I'm there. Thank you all so much and thank you for your patience. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging that I am privileged to live and work on the unceded territories of the Pequetlan Nations, which lies within the uncovered, uh, the unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Ketsi, Musqueam, Kikite, Squamish, and Stoyo Nations. What a privilege it is for us to, to meet today, talking about Africa Day. But before we go there, I really would like for us to um, acknowledge the fact that it is also the anniversary of the death of George Floyd, which you know it brings mixed feelings um, all around. And not to mention that we are in the middle of a pandemic too. So I'd like to start by um, saying thank you for organizing this event and uh, very thankful that you know um, 
the uh, Africa or AU happened when it happened. Of course, Africa still has its struggles, but we have come a long way and we continue to do the best that we can as a nation. Better yet, it, how important is it for us to celebrate the African Canadian women whose history goes a long, long, long way. I'm gonna take us back first to a 2018 Harvard Business Review publication, which was called Beating the Odds, which focused on answering one question. What does it take to succeed as a black woman? That was the question that they went out to ask um, executives that, that were in Fortune 500 companies. The research results, can be reduced to one word that came out of all the answers. And that one word was resilience. You're probably thinking that resilience is such a common word that it applies across the board to everyone because everyone struggles. Yeah, we know that. But in this case, it plays a, a role that is so huge because black women have gone through so much over the years. It also, um, you can go back two years ago and realize that they started off as a family unit. They started off with a different structure of family and had to come into Canada to adapt to a new system that was loaded with its own challenges. The Harvard research found out that the difference between resilience in the general population and the resilience in black women was that it, the black women relied heavily on the resilience more than any other subset of the population. And this was due to the frequency in which they were they encountered obstacles, they had setbacks in, you know, and how they had so many dynamics that were intersectional and were coming, you know, uh, bringing in the complexities into their lives. In each case, however, the research showed that they bounce back, they refuse to get distracted or derailed, they maintained forward progress. And one participant actually shared, I quote, we were all told that you had to be smarter, run faster, jump higher, or be better than anybody else around you just to stay in the game. I certainly wasn't raised in Canada or in the US, but I was also told the very same advice. We are asked by the communities and by the people around us to always be better than everybody else. Back to the Harvard study. The women who were studied developed three key skills that in those three skills contributed to the resilience. One was emotional intelligence. The second one was authenticity. And the third one was agility. These skills can help propel anyone's career. All professionals and organizations in which um, people work can benefit from cultivating and leveraging emotional intelligence, authenticity, and agility. And these are also very key characteristics that can be attributed to the Black women in Canada, as I mentioned earlier. You can look in history and you see Jean Augustine, Viola Desmond, Rosemary Brown, Mary Ann Shad, Anne Cruz, Carrie Best, Harriet Tubman, and the list goes on and on. It's, it's amazing that when uh, our Honorable was sharing his names, he actually had totally different names than I did, than I had, which shows you that we've got such a rich and long list of Canadian women that have gone before us and that have set such a successful precedent for us. The first recorded Black person arrived in Canada in 1608. Can you believe it? 1608. More would continue to come in the 17th and 18th century. And the key thing to note with all these people that were coming was that the extended familism was a permanent feature of life in Africa. So in Africa, if you look even today, the community includes the political aspect, the economic, the cultural dynamics, and it's more like you know, the extended basic family unit. 
So when you come into the West, the, all that changed. And women had to, to be the head, had to hold on the fort while they were facing so, so, so many challenges. Not to mention that they were dehumanized. They were seen as domestic agents. They were seen as unintellectuals. They were seen as agencies of basic labor. Despite their intelligence, always they had to keep the basic labor jobs. Their resilience was tested over and over and over. In her essay, Linda Cardi writes, given the terms under which women of African descent, descent in Canada first arrived in this country as slaves and later as escaped slaves or newly freed women from the American South, they have long understood that they've been assigned just about the lowest status of any group in Canada at the time. Historically, these women have not had easy access to state services such as education and welfare and have a long and documented history of working outside of the home for wages. The legacy of this combined history has played a key role in defining who they are. So if you see, she wrote this many years ago and it said historically as if it was ending. Fast forward to today, we are going through the pandemic and which subset of the population is affected the most? It is still the, 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 the visible minorities simply because they are still over indexing on the lower jobs, on the labor jobs. So this, the story has not changed up, to, up until now. So despite their hard work, African Canadian women have been rendered invisible. Many of the experiences have been made to just disappear into thin air, or they're simply systemically erased. In her 1992 book uh, called Feminism and the Question of Postmodernism, Judith Butler wrote, once it is understood that subjects are formed through exclusionary operations, it becomes politically necessary to trace the operations of that construct, construction and erasure. Today, many people are calling for Black history to be shared in schools. They are calling for Black history to be shared all around because Black history is Canadian history. Black women's history is Canadian history. However, we find ourselves, even with all these trailblazers that have gone before us, we are still fighting to be heard and fighting to make sure that that erasure doesn't continue. As we know, the media chooses what is attractive and they choose what they think their audience want to hear. And if you look at history and data, it shows that media gatekeepers constantly are not interested in Black women's stories. They're not, um, when we are doing well, it doesn't get shared. When we are doing bad, that's when it gets shared. Look at the stats that they share on how black women over index in jails, because that's what they think people want to hear. And that's the narrative that is being told. It is up to us to bridge that gap in history. I'm actually super proud of my city Coquitlam because in uh, three and a half years ago, they called me for an interview and the historian then proceeded to tell me that up until then, they had no history that anyone, any black person has ever lived in Coquitlam. And I was shocked. You have many families that have lived in Coquitlam for decades, but they were not documented anywhere in the Coquitlam Heritage Society um, books. But I'm proud of them because this year, for the first time, they're gonna have an event in the fall called, We Have Always Been Here. And what they have done is they're interviewing black women, black men, families about who they are and what, who they represent here in Coquitlam. They're even collecting recipes. And these are gonna go on to be the history that we are talking about here. This is gonna be the information and the narrative that will be told going forward, rather than us always waiting to have somebody else telling the narrative. 
earlier this year, I was asked to watch and review a 1991 documentary called Sisters in the Struggle. I hope that's not the one that you're showing tonight, is it? Is it the one? Uh, I cannot hear Dr. Adade, but anyway, I'll share what, what I no, have. No, no, uh, sorry. We're not sure that one. Yeah. Okay. okay, wonderful. <laughs> because I was going, wouldn't it be a coincidence if you're showing the same documentary? So 1991, this documentary called Sisters in the Struggle was shown, and it revealed an angry detail of how Black women resist the hegemonic discrimination that is institutionalized by government and by policy. The featured women were active in their communities. They were, you know, community organizers. They were politicians. They were labor and feminist organizers. They shared their insights and personal testimonies on a legacy of racism and sexism, on a legacy that always pushed them down rather than lift them up. I, re I highly recommend if people have not watched that documentary to watch it because it truly shows some of the struggles that the people that have come before us have gone through. The analysis they present links, links their struggles with the ongoing battle against racism and systemic violence against women and people of color 20 years later. And we are still talking about the same thing. And we are still talking and asking for the change because it's still not done. I'm going to go on to just talk a little bit about the stats that just came a couple of weeks ago. Some of you might have seen that. Statistics Canada just published that um, women are still earning 56% to the dollar of what a man earns. And visible minority women earn 32% of what non-visible minority women earn. So we are still at the bottom of the totem pole, right? Um, these findings, you know, um, were the same as what Globe and Mail actually did their own research. And it was a two year research where they were collecting data to try to get to the bottom of it. And they came up with the same results. And the most disturbing result was that only 3% of racialized women were in the higher positions. You know, even when we're not talking about the power gap, it shows because we are totally, totally um, not represented when it comes to the higher groups. And with all this, I want you to keep in mind all the work that has gone through that the women before us have done, the trailblazers, the work that they have put into, and yet we seem to be moving just an, an inch at a time. In public sector workplaces across Canada, men and women are separated not more than just by salary, but women and racialized people can break through to the highest level of decision-making tables. We are not sitting there where it matters. We keep facing that concrete ceiling. So I call on us today, you know, whether you are a male or a female, for us to really make sure that we lift black women up so that we can break this trend that has stayed for so many years and that need to be reversed. And for the black women that are on, on this uh, event that I saw, I've got a challenge for you. My challenge for you is to be bold enough to celebrate your strengths and your resilience, to be generous to yourself by acknowledging the steps you have taken thus far, to be wise enough to cut the branches that hold you back, to be present enough to protect and nourish your roots. I also challenge you to be resilient enough to stand tall like the baobab tree, be strong enough to get up every time you fall, be forgiving enough to forget the last mistake that you made, embrace your beautiful self, and love yourself the way that you are. May those that have come before us and those that are nudging forward and stepping into leadership today continue to help us to have all these qualities that we all need to get where we need to go. Thank you all so much. Thank you, our sister, 
we are very proud of you. Thank you for that nourishment, intellectual nourishment, giving a tapestry of what happened in the past with what is happening today, linking the struggles of our ancestors back on the continent and those in the diaspora, linking death and destruction with life and hope. Thank you so very much indeed. Now we're gonna have a moment of levity plus intellectual nourishment. We're gonna ask Scrothmouth, one of our celebrated you know, poets in the community to treat us some poetry, Scrothmouth. The floor is yours. Please unmute your microphone, Scrothmouth, if you're here. I think I saw him here. Scrothmouth, are you here? Okay, so it looks like um, he disappeared into thin air. All right, if that is the case, uh, let's get um, another poet um, to give us some, um, treat us to some intellectual nourishment. Um, Lindy, Lindy Note, if you are here, please. I am. Lovely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a joy and an honor to share this space with so many amazing and accomplished uh, women and men. Um, I am Lindy and I am a spoken word poet. I was born and raised in South Africa and I now live in Vancouver and um, I am very grateful to be living and playing on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh um, and Coast Salish peoples. And I'd like to share some of my poems with you. So um, I have a few that I'd like to share. Uh, the first one, just coming out of that beautiful, those beautiful words from Trish, I would like to um, honor the women who have come before me and who live here um, as both poets and intellectuals who have inspired me. And this poem is called uh, The Girl Would Rise. The girl did not know how she would rise. She only knew she would. The girl did not know how she would stand up only that she would not back down. The girl did not know how she would speak, only that she would not stay silent any longer. The girl did not know how she would rise, she only knew she would. The girl didn't know where she would go, only that it would be far away from cages. The girl didn't know how to be free, she only knew she would no longer bend the knee. The girl did not know how she would rise, only that she would. The girl didn't know how she would carry the burden of her dreams. She only knew her shoulders were built for it. The girl did not know all the answers. She only knew she was thirsty to ask better questions. The girl did not know how she would rise. She only knew she would. The girl did not know much but she knew she would rise and so she did. And across the world, you can see her rising still, slowly with fists full of love, with a resilient heart, with an unbendable spine, with arms wide enough to salvage the earth with forgiveness on her breath. She is rising. Thank you. Um, and if we have time for one more, I would like to share a poem with you, one or two more. Um, so this one is called How to Become a Woman in Five Steps. One, find your voice. It has been lost for some time. Somewhere something convinced it to hide and now like a child who believes in monsters in the dark, it's afraid and ashamed. So approach it slowly, beckon it to come forward gently and when it is ready, you will find it waiting somewhere between your head and your heart. Open your mouth and welcome any sound, no matter how quiet or how loud to just breathe and come out. Two. Be patient with your body. 
We all grow a little differently, but you are seedling seeking sunshine, stretch upward, open inward. You are full of beautiful creases and details and folds and corners and edges and beautiful, beautiful nuances. Three, take risks. I know the world demands a lot from us and sometimes it can all feel a little bit too much, but remember, without pressure, diamonds could not exist. Remember, you were born to take risks. You never would have learned to walk if you knew how often you'd bump into things and fall, so stand tall. Remember, when you were just a caterpillar preparing for the cocoon, never once did you second guess giving up your legs for wings. Never once did you think you would miss gravity. So fly, take risks, and dream on. Four, repeat these words daily. No matter how often my mind, my mirror, or the world tries to convince me, I am not empty. I am full, full of beauty, full of power, full of grace. And I know self-love is not easy, which is why you must practice it daily without failing. Five. Realize there is no step-by-step -step guide on how to become yourself fully. Some days it will feel like the entire world is set against you. And on those days, especially remember you are not alone. We are here standing shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, singing your song and cheering you on. Thank right you. on, Lindy, that was superb. <laughs> Thank you so very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you. Um, so let's move on. We are now going to ask um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Love S. Chile, uh, who is a researcher at University of British Columbia. Dr. Love S. Chile, please could you begin with a brief introduction of yourself? Of course. Hello, and thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today, and thank you to the Africa Canada Education Foundation for organizing this event. Um, I'm very excited to be able to participate and really just see all these great faces and hear some amazing conversations today. Um, and so happy, happy Africa Day to everybody. It's uh, such an important thing for us to be gathering even though we are virtual, uh, gathering together to celebrate where, we come, where, where we've come from and where we're going. Um, so I'm Dr. Lavesi Chile. Uh, my ancestors are from a place currently called Nigeria in Western Africa. Uh, I was born in Australia and raised in New Zealand. Um, so, but I've been in Canada for about 10 years now. So very much an international person, I'm sure like many people on the conversation today. So what I wanted to, uh, what I'd like to speak with everyone about uh, tonight is the importance of amp amplifying black voices, especially black women's voices in the science, technology, engineering and math fields. Um, and so the work that I've been doing, um, you know, I've been a researcher for, I guess, the last 10 years or so, and it's just become very evident, um, you know, the, the real need for more diversity, more voices, more, more people at the table when we're thinking about building new technologies, um, you know, asking different questions of our scientists and just really trying to drive the direction um, of our society. And, you know, since the industrial revolution, scientists have been innovating at a faster, at a faster rate than ever before. You know, we've, we've created all of these technologies, like even the fact that we're here sitting in this virtual room together, you know, 10 years ago would have been insane and crazy, um, let alone 50 years. And so, all of these scientific discoveries and these disruptions have really been miracles for some, bringing wealth and prosperity, but for others, they've been destructive, um, really leading to environmental devastation and social inequality. And so as a young person, when I was growing up, I was fascinated with science and the world around me and just the, the ways that I could just kind of break everything apart and to see how everything was working. Um, but I really recognized from quite a young age that this technological advancement is really a double-edged sword. You know, we can, we can create a lot of things, but we have to recognize that there's this impact both on us as a, uh, both on our culture and, then, uh, and on our environment as well. 
And so I went to graduate school. Um, I was really passionate about sustainability and trying to find ways to, to kind of bring, bring more greenness and bring more um, environmental thinking uh, into the work that I was doing. And so in graduate school, I was doing work on sustainable plastics. So my background is in plastics and uh, trying to make biodegradable plastics. Um, but when I was not doing my studies, I was really interested in, in the history of science. And I started to look at science from a historical lens through a feminist lens as well. And realizing that you know, the people who created science as an institution were all the same type of people, you know, older white people who had a lot of privilege, a lot of time, a lot of money. And when black people or people of color really engaged with science, it was a quite, a, quite an exploitative kind of um, interaction. You know, black bodies were being used. They were either being, you know, from something as terrible as a forced sterilization to something which, you know, is just unethical really, um, to people give, giving, um, being given vaccinations or being, um, you know, experimented on even in some respects. And so, from these kind of unethical and relatively damaging things to the to the black psyche, just even to um, to black women or just black bodies being excluded or being washed out of science. You know, um, there's this great the great movie from a few years ago called Hidden Figures about all of the black women who were um, part of the the U.S. space program who were just kind of erased from history. You know, black scientists like Katherine Johnson and Anne yeah, Eastley, who are physicists and mathematicians, and Alice Ball, who was the first uh, African-American woman to, to graduate from the University of Hawaii and what uh, created the treatment for leprosy. You know, it's so few of these people that we actually hear about. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the opportunities, I think, when, you know, thinking about um, black women being included in science, you know, often we, black women, as, as was said before in this conversation, you know, black women are leaders of the family. They bring their community with them. And so when we're trying to make space within the science community for black women, it, it's really important to consider that black women are going to be asking questions which are going to benefit their communities. They're going to benefit more than just, you know, the, their pocket or their bank account. They're going to be trying to find solutions to problems that are going to amplify and connect and, and, and just yeah, bring more people to the table and bring more innovation and things like that. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of um, chat a little bit about that in a bit more detail. So one of the organizations that I'm part of um, out, out of out of the University of British Columbia is the Lou Institute Network for Africa. Um, and so this this organization is really excited and interested in um, harnessing and mobilizing the diverse African diaspora by creating spaces to elevate the African voice and experience. And so the goal of this organization called LENA is to really um, to, to do some wide ranging um, knowledge mobilization and to start to establish and create platforms that will connect stakeholders that can influence policy and foster and cultivate solutions. Solutions about how global issues can, um, solutions about global issues affecting Africa and African issues affecting the world. And so, as was spoken about before, it's really all about what stories are being told. What are the narratives that are being put forth into our communities today? And ensuring that, making sure that black women at the table to make sure, uh, to be able to tell different stories and to actually create new technologies that are going to impact and influence um, not just themselves, but the community as a whole. And so in the work that I'm doing, I'm very much focused on green chemistry, sustainable science. Um, and over the last uh, you know, three years or so, I've, I've started two different companies. Um, one of them called the Regenerative Waste Labs, and the other one is called Grey to Green Sustainable Solutions. And so being a person from diverse backgrounds, both professionally and personally, I've always been very driven to connect people who, are, who don't usually come together. Uh, and so I really want to be able to co-create products and services that lead our communities into a greener, more equitable world. And so my, my intersections lie at the, um, at the kind of the, the crossroads between these ideas of circular economy, bioeconomy, green chemistry, sustainable science. And I'm really trying to take my scientific training into industry uh, to try to communicate and translate this knowledge into okay. new ventures yeah, and right. new initiatives as well. Um, and so 
just a little bit about myself. I think there's going to be an, uh, a question and answer in a, in a few minutes, so we can definitely ask more questions about my role specifically. But I just wanted to leave you with a bit um, with this idea that it's really important that we recognize that, you know, as a black woman, if you are a black woman on this call, or even a black man, a person of color in general, um, you are needed and you are valued in this space. And we need more black people, black women, uh, black men to be in these spaces so that when scientists and researchers are creating new technologies, creating new directions for our world to be going in, that we have this diversity of, of, of viewpoints, diversity of perspectives, because without it, you know, we're going to be continue to be excluded from these spaces. We're just going to continue have to having to, you know, convince people that we need to be here. And so just want to leave everyone with today um, is that this that you are needed in the space. I, I definitely recommend for you to come and to join in on some uh, science, technology, engineering, and maths um, enterprises or some nonprofits. Check out the Lew Institute Network for Africa. We have a few events coming up. Um, and I look forward to any questions that you might have a little bit later. Thank you. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Global citizen, global scholar, sustainable scholar, making the world green. Thank you, sister and fellow scholar. Um, we are going to continue. We're going to have another poetry before our next speaker. And so I think I can see Scroft Mouth here. Scroft Mouth. I remember the first time I met you several years ago with your comb, all right? Your comb to comb your afro. So Scroft Mouth, if you're here, please entertain us to some of your riveting and informative, you know, recitals. I know you're here, I can see you, Scrofma. Unmute yourself. Hmm. Scrof mouth, are you here? Can you hear me? Are you having difficulty? I say maybe he's having the same difficulty as me. It looks <laughs> like he is anything. looking like that. <laughs> All right. So then. I think that James Abra, another poet, is here. So, James, are you here with us? If you are, please let's hear you. Hello. Hi. Hi, you can hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome, and I feel welcome and I'm honored to be amongst you. I feel like the room is warm. I'd like to take a quick risk. Um, for, for, first, off, my, first off, my name is James um, and I have um, some poems for you. Sosa said I had 10 minutes to the floor. So I have, um, I have some poems in tow, but um, if I'm going over time, definitely <laughs> let me know. Um, first, I'd like to see everyone's faces. Um, so if you could, um, turn on your videos and quickly unmute. I'd like to see who's in the room. Thank you. It's great to see you all. Excellent. It's great to see you all. Okay. Oh, excellent. Oh, okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes. Okay. Just warming up the room. Warming up the room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I was if I was in your if I was in your presence, I would give you um, note to 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 clap your hands or snap your hands anytime you hear something exactly. Thank you, Lindy. Anytime you hear something that resonates with you, um, and we're going to start off with a little call and answer. Okay, and the call is um, "Pardon my African, I'm back again." Okay, so I'll say "Pardon my African, I'm back again," and then I'd like you to say. Pardon my African, I'm back again. Okay, we'll try it three times. We're gonna try it three times. And then after the third time, I would like you to mute. And I'm going right into my first one. Okay, so again, it's me saying, pardon my African, I'm back again. And you saying, pardon my African, I'm back again. So let's, let's try this. And can I believe we're in a room with some very smart yes, people? So should we ask everybody <laughs> to unmute um, their microphones then? So we can please. all hear. Please unmute yeah, your please. microphones, everybody. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> all right. Okay. We'll, we'll, see. We'll, we'll see how this works. All right, so let's, 
go. Pardon my African, I'm back again. 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 And good. Thank you. Pardon my Okay, now you may, you may mute your one microphones, one. please, everybody. But keep your, your I mean, cameras on so we can keep seeing your lovely faces. Pardon my African, I'm back again. Back is tough as nails. I conquer, sometimes I fail. This feeling suits me well. This feeling, pride on a million. My father had promised his children. So if God willing, the sky is the ceiling. Part of my African, I'm back again. No matter the shade, still wonderful, fearfully made. If I cross you on the street, I'm smiling. I'm nodding, I'm waving, not looking at the pavement. Sometimes saying, so great, so nice to see you. Part of my African, I'm back again. Not meant to give up, not meant to give in. Some of the highest seats occupied by thine and we creatives, educated, melanated, black stars, actors, doctors, researchers, preachers, teachers, council leaders featured. We came from part of my African, I'm back again. Okay, and I will continue. I like to I like to always start with um, the origin, right? Just where where I came from, um, and this is a sort of an unspoken conversation, a spoken and an unspoken conversation um, I've had with um, my mother, a very powerful, um, um, and inspiring black woman. So um, I call this the burden. Okay. Can you hear me still? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, words she whispered to me that day. She said, my baby, you're a star. She said, I look up and no matter how far you go, no matter how far you are, you'll always be mine. See those, see, those are words from the divine. She said, it's in you, no need to worry. She knows actors sometimes don't survive the story, but she was hopeful she was. She said she'd take a few odd jobs to make life even, even though to get to the other side, you'd have to brace yourself from a stone's throw. This is the opus as far as poems go. This is the origin. Do you hear me? Kindly mute your mic if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Words she whispered because she done seen a few too many not make it home. And she feared if I was alone on my own, I might not have GPS to see the best outcome. And without one, two, three, pardon me. Um, how many chances, how many lives, how many breaths are we going to take for granted? Lately, my esteem just ain't what it used to be. It seems where she whispered because some do see color and she prayed I'd be kept safe. That's home plate, that's valuable stored safe. I know the rhyme scheme is cute, but can you hear me? Back to that star we explored before the world tried to obliterate. That was really a plane I that soared where she whispered, she saw the bigger picture. She said, love your sister. She said, keep your brother close, tight, clo closer than bated breath. Words she whispered came to pass. Words she whispered. Okay, how are we doing for time? Three, three more minutes. Three more minutes. Okay, let's get right into it. Um, <laughs> we, 
we've we've heard about resilience. We've heard um, about love. I'd like to dive right into a piece um, that I call self-love. Self-love. Don't ask me about inspiration. It's usually pain. Don't ask me about ego surmounting. It's usually shame. Find something less basic to dance in, not acid rain. Feel we're not balanced when you're not encouraging. Um, uh, but a cloud that I might leap upon, ready to reset like a tree when all the leaves are gone. Um, how can I matter to me more? I really want me to accept me, take care of me, don't neglect me, honor me and respect me. Um, that's the right thing to do for myself. I want to know me better than on a first name basis, better than, yeah, that's my face and my body shape. I want to pass time with every line, hair, cell. We'll chat for hours. We'll be friends first and see what happens from there. Like, uh, no, no, you hang up. No, no, you hang up. No, no, you hang up. It's the right thing to do for myself. Uh, new season, better wash your dishes, clean your clothes, couple worries fester on me, all of them old, trying to put them all on consignment, not grapple with, uh, watch my arms unfold. Like Victoria told me, if it doesn't serve you, better pack your bags and go with tact. I'm learning, if it's not deserving of my energy, just let it be. Better to cope without false hope, better to see you through these eyes, these eyes behold infinite beauty we are. Lovely, lovely young poets with a lot of vitality and wisdom. I think somebody's hand is up. Ivy, Ivy's hand is up. Ivy, do you have a question or an observation or a remark? No, I was just clapping for a good. Uh, oh, is oh this a clapping. Clap? All right. Okay, yeah. okay. Oh, I misread the body language. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. So let us move on. Uh, we are now going to invite another young, you know, young lady with a lot of vim and vitality, energy and optimism, and that is our one and only one, Sosa Ewaka. You are muted. <laughs> I haven't muted myself. Thank you, Dr. Quest, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land we gather is a traditional and unceded territory of the Semiamu, Katsi, Kwikwetlan, Kwantlen, Kaikit, and Tuatha First Nations. I would also like for us to take a moment to reflect on what this means to us. I'd like to say a big thank you to Dr. Chris Dadi, who is the founder of the Africa Canada Education Foundation for organizing this event in honor of Africa Day. Since today is Africa Day, I thought it would be a good idea to start my speech by define, defining the word African. Africans are descendants of natives of Africa or individuals who trace their ancestry to indigenous inhabitants of Africa. Without a doubt, African women have made great strides in our society. Some of us remember the movie Black Panther, which brought to the fore relating to the issues and the role of African women in society as custodians of the African culture. We would never be able to talk about the history of African women who were warriors without mentioning women such as Ya Asantela, who promoted women's emancipation by promoting gender equality. Um, Viola Desmond, who is on our Canadian $10 bill, a successful black businesswoman who was jailed, convicted and fined for defiantly refusing to leave a white filming area of a movie theater in 1946. Because she was put on our banknote, our Canadian $10 bill, has been named for the first time in 15 years as the best in the world. She's now considered to be a civil rights hero and the first woman outside of the royal family to be featured in a Canadian currency. 
I'd mention Ellie Johnson Sarleaf, Liberia's festival president, and the late Dr. Wangari Masai, Kenya's environmental activist, political activist, and Nobel Peace Prize winner, to mention a few, are women who have had great impact on women, but more importantly, African women, and most notably society, because they are seen as role models. These women bring hope to millions of women around the globe. Don't African women deserve to be in a place of power? I'll talk about Ungazi Okonjo Iwiala, who is the Director General of the World Trade Organization. History was made on the 15th of February when the General Council agreed to select Ungazi Okonjo Iwiala of Nigeria as the organization's seventh director general. She's also the first woman and first African to be chosen as director general. She's to maintain that office until the 31st of August, 2025. Don't African women deserve to be in a place of power? I'd like to talk about the positive change that could occur when women take up leadership positions. Um, using Rwanda as an example, um, Take, for example, the country in Rwanda in 2003 had 30% 30, 30 of women in parliament. In 2008, they had 56% of women in parliament. But something historic happened in 2013 in Rwanda. The game changed when women occupied 64% of seats in parliament, making Rwanda one of the top countries for women in politics. Uh, this is a groundbreaking achievement that surpassed the progress established democracies have made. In, 20, in 2018, the number increased to 68%. Ever since, women have been able to occupy seats in parliament and they have contributed immensely to peace building uh, since the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Uh, some of the contributions they have made include boys and girls go to school in equal numbers, um, women now open bank accounts, Mothers pass citizenship to their children, women and girls inherit, buy and own land, and both genders conduct affairs primarily on an equal legal footing. There have also been 580 primary schools since 2003 to 2015. I'd like us to imagine for a second. So imagine if we had more women in parliament in other African countries, Without a doubt, there will be a lot of progress regarding governance. If we could replicate what happened in Rwanda throughout the continent, just imagine what impact that would have on the continent, social, political, and economic development. I would also like to highlight the impact African women have made throughout the world. So speaking about Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first female president in Africa, during her tenure as president, she ensured that women could be recruited into the armed forces. She raised almost $5 billion of her nation's foreign debt and supervised the increase of the national budget from, from $80 to $516 at some point. She revised the rape law and launched a national program to increase the education for girls. She also promoted gender equality by making a set of amendments to the 1986 election laws. Kenya's very own Dr. Wangari Matai had a significant impact on Kenya as a country and by extension, the world. Matai being an environmental activist, political activist, had a lot of accomplishments, but she's known for the Green Belt Movement. So for those of us who do not know, the Green Belt Movement is an environmental organization that empowers communities, particularly women, to conserve the environment and improve livelihoods to respond to the needs of rural Kenyan women who reported that their streams were drying up, their food supply was less secure, and they had to walk further and further to get firewood as well and fencing. Currently, over 50 million trees have been planted in Kenya Due to the Green Belt Movement, the Green Belt Movement is geared towards meeting sustainable development goals in sustainable cities and communities. Masai's Green Belt Movement is a great example of how one person, one person 
can turn around the lives of thousands, if not millions of others, by empowering others to change the situation. So now, let us imagine if women took up more political offices. Um, let us imagine the effect it would have on Canada and Africa at large. I believe it would have a tremendous impact on the social, political, and economic development of the continent, Africa. Therefore, it, be all, it behoves us all to act as influencers on the continent's progress. What is my point today? My point is that when African women are given the opportunity to make a change, they make global impact. I also believe that one thing is instrumental to change, which is storytelling, telling stories, telling our stories of African women who have made great strides. I want each of us to know that nobody can tell our stories better than we can because our experiences are unique. Women of influence, women that hold powerful political positions, heads of corporations must or should be encouraged to tell their stories. That way, they are inspiring the young generation to embrace change. Thank you. What an inspiring speech, what homage to our women. Thank you, young lady. Thank you very, very much indeed for that riveting speech. Um, we're now going to have our Q&A period, that is questions and answers, uh, to be asking our um, speakers questions that we have for them. You may type your question in the chat room, or you can simply take the mic, all right? It's an open mic and open chat room. So let's ask our questions. We're going to um, devote about five minutes for Q and A, and we'll move on. Please. Okay. May I ask the first question uh, to um, of uh, Doctor Love Essay Chile? What are some of the challenges? that you face as a female scientist in the sustainable you know, field? And how did you surmount or overcome them if you were able to overcome them at all? That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, there's so many challenges. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure everyone realizes in the sustainability world, trying to get um, people to change their ways is challenging. Um, but with regards to being a, a black woman in science, um, I guess some of the challenges I've faced is, is really just around um, getting my perspective uh, heard. Um, and I guess, you know, I feel like my being a black woman and my, my desire to, to drive sustainability, uh, sustainability issues and initiatives uh, kind of go hand in hand. And so, yeah, when I, when, I, when I talk to people about wanting to um, encourage sustainability, it, for me, it's really about, um, it's about building community. It's about bringing people together. It's about empowering people with knowledge and empowering them with understanding and the ability to, to, rise them, to raise themselves out of, um, out of, out of, out of, out of um, issues and out of these challenges. Um, and so, yeah, so, but the way I kind of get around that um, is really about uh, building community and um, uh, building collaborations and having conversations. So bringing diverse voices into the room together um, so we can share our perspectives together rather than me just you know, telling people this is how it should be. It's really about bringing people into that conversation and, and figuring out what makes the most sense for everybody in that, in that stakeholder group, everyone in that room. Um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely think it's important to be seeking out different voices, seeking out the people um, who you want to be talking to. Um, you know, for example, if you're starting an initiative, you need to talk to all the people in that community or the people who be, might be affecting and all the people whose voices you may not be hearing. Um, and that's hard to do, uh, to, you know, to, to seek out the people who you may not realize should be there. Um, but that's where that conversation and that collaboration really comes into it. Lovely. Thank you, thank you. Any questions? Any questions for our lovely 
and intelligent and inspiring speakers, there's an open mind. Don't feel shy. Don't keep your knowledge to yourself. Share. All right. Um, we are going to log on and uh, we are going to now. I have um, a question. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. That's all right. Very good. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm very concerned. I've been working with women with disabilities for the past 19 years. And women with disabilities, they are triply vulnerable at the level of their gender, the level of their disability, and the level of their economic enrichment. And this is basically due to exclusion. Because of most of the works we do, we don't bring in the element of inclusivity. And how do we? Um, ensure that women with disabilities are involved in all what we are doing. If not, we'll be solving a problem of racism. Meanwhile, we'll be creating another venue of marginalization. How do we ensure that at the level of our organization, at the level of our attitude, at the level of our technology, at the level of our communication, and at the level of our architecture, we make sure women with disabilities are involved. So how do we do that? If, uh, or do you take that into consideration? Or how do you think we are going to make sure that this is been enhanced in what we are doing? Thank you. All right, so um, maybe any of the speakers can address that. I can chime in on that one. Okay. Great, great question, Magdalene. Um, if I can put on my political hat for a second, that's exactly um, the way that we, we wanna approach the communities is by not only looking at race. I always like to tell people that there are so many dimensions of difference and race and ethnicity are only two different dimensions. So I think I challenge all of us to, to really look at the whole intersectionality that affects us, that affects people around us. If we can look at that, we truly will aim at building communities that are inclusive, not only based on two items or two um, dimensions of difference, but based on all types of difference. So it, it is really something that we need to challenge ourselves we need to tap into our own emotional intelligence and ask, like um, Dr. Chile said, who is missing? Whose voice is missing, right? When you're doing that consultation, ask yourself, is there a voice that's missing? And many times we will identify who is missing and we'll be able to invite them to the table. And therefore, whether we're making policies or whether we're making any changes, we will make those changes with their perspective in mind. Thank you very much. Any other contributions? Before, before anybody comes in, I'd like to add that, um, yes, intersectionality is very, very important. So is mutual empathy and allyship. We need to mutually empathize. Put yourself in the shoes or walk in the shoes of the other person whether that person has attribute, one attribute is a handicap to him or her. Empathize, ask yourself, what if I were in the shoes of that person, what would I do? And then put on that mentality of being an ally to help lift up, right? Those who are downtrodden, those who are handicapped, um, physically, you know, um, politically, economically, and what have you, that is one of the ways to overcome and uplift, overcome our problems and uplift ourselves collectively, allyship and mutual empathy. All right, so um, any other questions, any other observations, any other contributions? If not, then we are going to ask um, indeed, the cascade. I think she is here to entertain us. Nidi, are you here? Oh, she is. All right. Yes, I am. Lovely. 
Hi, greetings, everyone. It's really awesome to hear all of your voices and feel your insights. Much appreciated. I'm going to do a couple songs for y'all today. Um, it goes a little something like this. Hopefully you can hear the sound okay. Back in the days when I used to count syllables, I began to wonder if I was atypical. Too critical, afraid of the ridicule. Little did I know that I could be pinnacle. I started kicking incredible tight flows. The kids in the front row, be how does she write those? I reply, I'ma discredit the most high. If it wasn't for the I and I, I would just die. Indeed, you see, she's so dramatic. Some of y'all will live with me, raw, they're just fanatic. Well, I had it. Labels and fables and stable lies. Eyes closed in the moment of truth. You don't rise just to divide yourself. Realize your wealth, cause every other person reflects your other self. And if you travel and revel the almanac, and stop eating the cattle, we'll battle another cast. You will see the truth in a totally different light. So unite, cause knowing the truth is what's right. Knowing the truth is what's right. Knowing the truth is what's right, yeah. If I hang from a cliff by my fingertips, I pray you'll be saved by an emerald ship. Look what happened to Hendrix. Star Child came to the world using music to bridge tight the black and the white fight back. All the common oppression with insight, but he became the target of Shaitan. That's one more soldier to fall into Babylon. And I swear that'll never happen to me. Happen to be strapped for the divinity. But I admit, times when I'm tempted to quit, tempted to trip and slip down, fall off the cliff. But I'm equipped with serious gifts to uplift. Up like Vesuvius Mount erupted. Hey. The traps are snap, but worth it. Living after me, a seat since my birth kit. I'm a leaving to grow, cause I know the smile of a child is worth more than gold. What if I hang from a cliff on my fingertips? I pray I'll be saved by an emerald ship. Ah, uh, if I slip thick. Yo, I want to be a conscious MC, let it be. I want to write a rhyme in a tree, let it be. I want to sip on fresh herbal teas, be the best I could be, so the rest can be free, let it be. Because I believe in community, let it be. And I believe in our harmony, let it be. I want to see how blessed we can be to invest in the key, so the rest can be free. What if I hang from a cliff from my fingertips? I pray you'll be saved by an emerald ship. Ah, uh, if I slip thick, yo, rips, why did I have to trip? If I hang from a cliff by my fingertips, I pray I'll be saved by an emerald ship. Uh, if I slip, thick, kill rips, why did I have to trip? Uh-huh, I said, why did I have to trip? Uh-huh, I said, why did I have to trip? Uh-huh, I said, why did I have to trip? Uh-huh, I said, why did I have to trip? Uh-huh, I said, why did I have to trip? Uh-huh, I said, why did I have to trip? Uh-huh, I said, why did I have to trip? Uh-huh, I said, why? All right. All right. So we are living in a, in a beautiful time of transition right now. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Hey, great, great, very great. I have one more song for y'all. And oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, my... please. We will, we will be glad to listen. Thank we you. love to listen. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to hear that and you yeah, and yeah. you know what at the end of my set I'll, I'll give everybody my information if you want to hear more of my music but i just want to say that we're living really in a very great, beautiful man. transitional man, time fan, right now fan, where fan. all of our voices can come together to change the world all right so here's this next track remix hey this is an end master beat This is from a woman who struggled to carry life. This is for the physically beaten, abused wife. This is from my warriors and the torch carriers. This is from my Africans living in different areas. This is for the children who live with HIV. This is for the slaves that are buried in every sea. This is for the brothers who fall into cold streets. This is for the tears that are carved in the mother's cheeks. This is for my people trying to keep it equal. This is for the patients who struggle to keep it legal. This is for the natural past and herbalists. This is for the teller of tales and lyricists. Uh, you and I, are you and I T? Are you and I? Are you and I T? Are you and I? Are you and I T? 
A A U N I T Y. What rhythm deliver wrist? Smooth like Arabic dialect. May the most high bless the lioness. Call an eye, simplify, high and divide you and I. To a skip up on the I and I. Why? Looking inside to get by. Both meditation and prayer do apply. Stuck in the middle of heaven in Babylon. Running under the roads that I can travel on. But I carry on running the length of marathons. Give a shout out to Khalil Gibran for being strong, proving the authority wrong. Hitting from the tree of life to live long. Cause balance is good for you, so don't trip. It's a synthetic that'll make you slip. When I was a kid, they made fun of my lips. And now they take the fat out from the back of their hips. Uh, you and I, are you an IT? Hey, are you an IT? Why? Once upon a time, there was a strong Nubian, Abyssinian, black child playing in the wind, looking beautiful, strong, third eye, confident, suitable to be any nation present, a very relevant ruler of the space, like an elephant, humble, respect the earth from the bumble, be to the trees, to his ancestry. Now he's a victim to these inner city streets, at least. His experience is written in stone, stuck in the dome, a young one to roam alone, and on the throne, singing in tones that are unknown, now looking for a spot that they can call. Who is missing? Corporate divisions and politicians are ailing. They keep faulty decisions to make billions. All them blood spilling, misleading our children. Yeah, instead we should be building. Yeah, instead we should be building. That's right, yeah. You and I, are you and IT? You and I, are you and IT? You and I, are you and IT? Hey, are you and IT? Why, yeah? You and I, are you and IT? You and I, are you and IT? You and I, are you and IT? Are you and IT? Why? One love, one people. My name is Indidi Cascade, hip hop artist, educator, arts facilitator, and I'd like to see. Y'all, again, thank you so much. I'm seeing your chats here. I'll just throw my um, website up in the chat here. Y'all can add me. Thank you so much for having me. Lovely. Thank you, Ndidi. Yes, you seem very, very well, good. Thank you. Big so friend. Good. We became a big fan. All I right. We really love hip hop. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's plug on. Um, we're going to have, hopefully, um, now. Scruff mouth. Are you here with your scruffy mouth? <laughs> <laughs> Are you here, scruff mouth? Please. <laughs> Can't wait to um, hear you. Are you having problems, scruff mouth? Sorry, Dr. Kraft. He, he yes. initially mentioned that um, he's on set currently, so he might not be able to, oh. to recite his poem. Yeah. Oh, OK. He's All right. Here. OK. All right. Um, unfortunately, we can't also screen our documentary because we have some technical issues. So um, let me see here. I think we are almost at the end of the evening. Scrofma was supposed to have, you know, send us off with his um, Scrofma poetry, uh, but he's not here. So. Um, I like to say a few words um, to wrap things up. I think that this evening has been a very productive, informative, and nourishing evening. Uh, the speeches, uh, the, po the poems, and the performance were all very, very interesting and very informative. Um, today is 63 years ago when Africa came together, African leaders, 32 African leaders came together to form the Organization of African Unity, hoping uh, to bring all Africa under one umbrella government to pull their resources in order to advance. Um, unfortunately, the original dream of a continental union government of Africa didn't come to pass because some of the African leaders didn't want Africa to move that time fast, claimed that it must be a gradual movement. And um, that led to um, the gradual movement that we are on today, um, some of the leaders, Nkrumah and others said that you know, we needed to move very fast because 
but into Nkrumah. Our problems are not like a frozen entity and say that let's solve this problem, put it down, solve that one and put it down, and then we'll say, oh, we solved all that problem. Now let's unite. It will be too late. And indeed, Nkrumah, Nkrumah's son prophecy has come to pass. We are now you know, disunited and it's becoming increasingly difficult to form that continental union government of Africa. But there is still hope. A new crop of leaders, our youngsters, are now fired up, all right, to make that dream to come true. Um, today's event is also happening at the confluence of the tragedy that happened last year, the, the, the brutal murder of our brother um, um, in, the, in the USA. And we are here today to pay homage you know, to him and also uh, to uh, those who have fallen you know, before, who sacrificed, shed their blood, toiled, so that we may live. So let us carry on the struggle in our own small ways, all right? We may think that what we are doing here doesn't make much difference, but believe you me, we are making difference. We are educating ourselves and others about the need, all right, to push forward, raise our consciousness, okay, and become more alert to our problems, challenges, and also the opportunities that lie ahead of us. So at this juncture, I'd like to call on Ivy also answer to give the vote thanks. Thank you, Dr. Quest. So on behalf of the African Canada Education Foundation, we would like to extend our, our very hearty vote of thanks to our honorable members of parliament. Um, Honorable Andrew Messia MLA for Langley, um, Honorable Mauto Ali for Ghana, High Commissioner to Canada for making time of your busy schedule and gracing this event. Um, we would also like to greatly thank all our distinguished speakers and performers and everyone attending this event. Um, we are really grateful. And finally, a huge thank you to our funders. Um, it wouldn't be possible without our funders. So we want to thank the BC government, um, the Department of Multiculturalism of BC and Van City for their support. Um, once again, thank you everyone. Um, I think so with this, I'll just pass it to Reverend Madeline for the closing prayer. It looks like you're still muted, Reverend. Sorry, sorry. Thank you for the opportunity again. And tonight, I want to say thank you, Lord, for this awareness. The Bible says my people perish because of lack of vision. We want to appreciate you for the vision you've given for us to press forward, to know what it's needed, and to know what opportunity there be for us to come out of it. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 3, verse 6, it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of the challenges. Do not be afraid of the ordeals. Do not be afraid of the problems. For I will go with you. I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. Tonight, Lord, we want to say as one voice, we are pressing on to the mark that lies ahead of us, for our voices to be heard and for our space to be given. I want to declare that we cannot do it without you. And you've said we should call unto you, call unto the name of the Lord and you'll be safe. Our safety is in you. Our success is in you. Our achievements are all in you. You created man in your image and in your likeness, and you say, go and multiply, replenish the earth and dominate. We, as women, we shall replenish the earth, we shall dominate, we shall take our space in the name of Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity that all the discussions and deliberations will bear fruit and will come to discuss and to glorify your name. Energy and virtues, has gone out of all those who presented, replenish them a hundredfold. 
that in the next meeting we'll have more of way forward. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Take every honor, take every glory, take every adoration in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Chris, I think yeah. um, yeah. Scruff yeah. Mouth is back. Oh, Scruff. Okay, lovely. Okay. Yeah. So, so we would end with a poem. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's right. Lovely. Thank you. Scruff Mouth. Check it over now then. Okay. Are you still here? We have him. You are muted, Scruff Mark. Unmute your microphone. I hear Scruff Muff. Yes, yes, okay. I am here. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's your turn. Yeah, go ahead. We've been waiting. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Can you okay? Yes. Can you guys hear me okay? okay. So I would like to. Uh, it's a bit. It's a bit, through the it's a bit choppy. Can you hear me okay, though? Yeah, it's better now, yes. Okay, so I'm going to give some context for this poem. It's called The Ballad of Black Matthew. And I was able to accompany Aita Sadu of a different bookstore as she toured the schools in BC during Black History Month. And she had composed a song about Mechikasa, the first Black man to explore Canada the guy who brought Champlain to Canada. And as I accompanied her through these elementary schools, I thought to myself, this is awesome. A song that engages youth with some history. And I thought to myself, there's another aspect to this history that is not for elementary school kids. So I took it on myself to uh, kind of also write a dub poem called The Ballad of Black Matthew. And I definitely big up the historians that have guided me on my poetic journey, including Aita Sadu, Dr. Afwa Cooper, as well as many others. So here now is The Ballad of Black Matthew. Bonjour, bienvenue à Quaba. Medinde name is Matthew de Costa. First to arrive, like this poet Aita say, first to arrive from way back in the day. Coast to coast, me reach all of the peoples them. An upstanding member in societies of men. The order of good cheer, I took them from there to hear what me never know as only me could have feared. You see me navigate the ship across the sea. But them never name a piece of water after me. Them call me Negro, Negro, and more. I'm a free black man upon Canadian shores. Me link up with all of the native peoples them, from the great white north down to brown and Caribbean. Indigenous, original, and West Indian. Uno paid top dollar to me to find the land. We work for the Gua City, Mountain Champlain. Discovery and conquest is the name of the game. Then pay me for play. So me can't complain. Only if you're a big ransom to that's the slave trade. Me speak too much Creole. Them can't sell me down the river. Big money contracts on me have to deliver. So hear me say, bienvenue. Bonjour, Aquaba. Me din day name is Matthew de Costa. I come from Congo by way of Portugal. No matter what the language me respond to the call. Me serving Canada, Acadie, and Nouveau France. In Swatchen, I'm a throw in a old Amsterdam. I left the motherland from the coast of Angola. Sailed up to Spain so that I could say Ola. Translator, trans transatlantic crusade victim. I am a free man, so me learn to speak pigeon. Interpreter and sailor to all the known lands. Black man to the cast of the great African. The black Amores that ruled the fame were overthrown. Asiento for pirates from the 
paper phone. If you can't chat the language when you build Bible Tower, you now get the culture and you can't hold the power. So them send companies and Christians for missions. Them kidnap me for interpret and listen. So me say, Biabunu, Bajo, Aquaba, me din de near is not to the coaster. I'm fluent in Flemish, French, Dutch, and Europa. Me chat, trade, pigeon, Basque, and even Patois. Make Mac, Italian, Swahili, Portuguese, German, Arabic, Spanish, and Congolese. Abenaki, Catalan, Tree, and Acadian. I am the first black man to be Canadian. So me sing again, Biabunu, Bajo, Aquaba. Me din de near is Machu de Costa. I navigate the planet and all of the seven seas. Me tell you right now, white men bring death and disease. Conspiracy to kidnap, thief, and colonize, committing crimes against humanity in front of my eyes. How can I work for this man that I detest? Them asking for the key to open up the treasure chest. Them have to build bigger ships and trade in slavery. Time to use my moral compass and some bravery. Some will refuse to give further direction to the Dutch man and get accused of interaction. Them lock me up and say, Matthew de Coste. You can never stop the African Holocaust. The European battleships are ready for. So who in this world do you think you are? For the last time, Biamanu, Banjo, Akwaba, Midende, name is Matthew de Costa. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so very much for that wonderful poem, taking us back to the continent and to, uh, to Canada, the first Black Canadian. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed, Ms. Croftmouth. I miss your Afro and your comb. <laughs> the first time I met you, you had an Afro and you had a comb and it was so, so riveting, so interesting. My son actually um, saw you as um, you know, a role model. <laughs> he has been asking me all the time, where is That Kaufman? was a long time ago. So. That was a long time ago indeed. Lovely. Thank you all very much. We indeed. need an apple and a comb emoji. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you. Lovely, thank it's you so really very really much. Thank you for, uh, we're on set for a movie right now, so thank okay. you for receiving my poem and all the best. Very good, same to you, thank you. All right, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as we say in Swahili, Asante Sana, Waheri, Wantu, Wazuri, beautiful people. Thank Waheri you. All right, okay then. All right, so it's over. It's over, over and over. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Asante Sana. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Happy African Day. Thank you. Bye, Professor. Bye bye, my friend. Thank you. My bye, friend. Thank Thank you professor. Professor. bye, 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 professor. Bye bye. See you on Thursday, everybody. Thank you. Bye, -bye. professor. Bye bye. Bye, professor. Thank you. Bye, bye professor. Thank you. Bye, bye, professor. Ta 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 ta. Bye bye. Bye, professor. Ta ta. Ta ta, professor. Professor, I want to know that uh, where you buy this cap? My cap? <laughs> yes, Professor. Okay, I, I bought it actually. I bought it long, it was long ago, probably maybe 10 years ago at uh, Walmart. <laughs> Who do you know? You like my hats. It's great. Professor, I searched on Amazon and Flipkart. There is no head of this type. <laughs> okay. All right, okay, bye-bye.